Hello everyone, welcome to the Sam and Ryan YouTube channel. My name is Ryan McCartan. I will be your host for today's video. This is a very special episode of Sam and Ryan YouTube, the musical, because we actually had an entire beautiful video for you that was supposed to come out this week. Sam and I filmed it. We had an amazing conversation. Oh my goodness, we had so much fun, the way we laughed, the memories we made. And then we went to edit the footage and we realized that Sam's audio did not work for the entire shoot. So we are going to attempt to reshoot that video and uh, release it soon. But I said that I'd take one for the team and put together a very quick video so that we could get something out for you guys. And I owe you anyway. We've been playing a game here on the channel called Two Truths and a Lie from My Career, where I've told you three stories, all of which are true, but one of which contains a bold-faced lie. And your job is to guess which story contains the lie. Every time we do a video, I tell you three new stories, but I also reveal the truth from the last video. So if you haven't seen the last video, Two Truths and a Lie about my Broadway injuries, make sure you go and check that out here on our channel so that you can guess which one is the story that contains the lie because I'm about to reveal it to you right now. Okay, so I told you three stories last time. One was about taking a kick in the face during a Frozen dance call where I made a joke, hey, now that I got kicked in the face, don't you think you should give me the part? And then they gave it to me. I told a story about how I got injured in Wicked twice in a row. First, I injured my ankle, then I came back. I did a rope swing effect, my elbow popped and I was out of the show. And this third story was more of an emotional injury where I was supposed to go to Norway with Disney's Frozen on Broadway to do a behind the scenes Disney documentary in Norway, all expenses paid, and the trip was canceled because of the pandemic. The story about getting kicked in the face during the Frozen dance call and the story about the Norway trip are both true. The story about the wicked injuries is true, but they're contained a lie because the story that I actually told was better than how it happened in real life. How I said it happened in the video was that I injured my ankle, I was out for two weeks rehabbing my ankle, then I came back, I did the show a few times, I heard my elbow pop, and I was immediately out of the show. Unfortunately, it's worse than that. I never heard my elbow pop. I kept doing this rope swing effect over and over and over again, and it kept hurting my entire arm more and more and more. And everyone there, and I'm not blaming anyone, because a lot of people suffer, not like injuries, but just like random aches and pains. Theater is a hard job. And so everyone there was like, you're fine, it's not a big deal, don't worry about it, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine. And so I muscled through for like a month where I literally, it got to the point, every time after I did this rope swing, I would go backstage and I would do a crossword puzzle and it got to the point where I could not even hold a pencil in my hand because my arm, my elbow, my shoulder, everything was hurting so bad. I ended up going to the doctor and getting x-rays. And in the story, I told you that I got immediate news from the doctor. I didn't. The doctor was like, honestly, I don't really see anything alarming here. I'm gonna send you in for an MRI. It's gonna take us a while to get those results. Just rest it, ice it, don't work out too much, do whatever you can to keep your elbow calm, but you can continue doing the show. I go in, I get an MRI. I'm continuing to play Fiero eight shows a week. And one day I got a call from my doctor at places saying, I'm so sorry, I know that you are about to start a show, but I have to pull you immediately. You should not be doing this show. I just found the issue and we have to pull you out as soon as possible. So I ended up doing the first couple of sequences of that show while my understudy was getting ready and I had to call out mid-show because my doctor called at places after everyone had said, this is probably not a big deal, including my doctor, probably not a big deal, just rest it, just ice it, you'll be fine. And in the 11th literal hour, they found what the issue was and I was pulled from the show for two months. So the story that I told was kind of true, but it was actually worse in real life than the story that I told on that video. Again, if you haven't seen that video yet, go check check it out. The story that I told, even worse than that. So there you go. The story about my elbow popping was not true. There was never a pop. It was just a dull ache that got worse and worse and worse and worse over time until finally I was called out of the show in the 11th hour. So this two truths and a lie episode is all about sex scenes. <laughs> I'm going to tell you three stories and you are going to have to guess which of these three stories is the lie. Again, these stories may contain nuggets of truth, but within one of these stories is a bold-faced lie. So here we go. I'm going to tell you three stories about times that I've had to do sex scenes on film, television, or on stage, and you're going to guess which one is or contains the lie. This first story 
is a doozy. I worked on a movie, I'm not gonna name the movie by name, it actually never came out. The last that I heard from the producers was a few years ago and they were like, we're still working on it. But I shot this movie, I'll just say over five years ago and it still hasn't come out. And to be completely honest, I pray every day that it never does. This is at a time in my career where I really just wanted to work on something. I auditioned for this random independent movie I didn't really know anything about. They really liked me. I got an offer. The money wasn't great. The script was kind of funny. The character was cool. So I figured, you know what? I need to get the ball rolling. I need to get a sense of momentum. I need to feel good about myself as a performer. So I took the job. On paper, it seemed like this job would be really easy. The script was charming. The schedule was manageable. My character wasn't too big. I thought it was gonna be very much business as usual. And for a while, it, it really seemed to be. In the last couple of weeks of production though, things kind of got off the rails. Sometimes creative types, you know, directors, producers, whatever, want to just sort of like go off script and just like try random things because they're thinking a few steps ahead of the process. When I get to the edit, I'm gonna want some random things to cut to. How am I gonna piece all this together? I know what footage I have. I want some extra stuff in the middle. So I understand that. So a lot of the times in a process when you're making a movie, the director will just kind of be like, okay, this was never scripted, we're just gonna try something. And at the end of the process, there were a lot of days where we would go in and have no idea what we were about to shoot, and the director would just kind of like make stuff up, and we just kind of had to do what he said. We wrapped the movie, it's all good, everyone moves on with their life, and I don't hear anything about this movie for like a year. The movie doesn't come out. I hear nothing about the picture being locked. I don't have to do any ADR, which is where you go back in and like dub your lines over if they missed any audio or anything. Like any of the post-production processes were not happening. So I kind of figured the movie was dead in the water. Then like a year later, I get this call being like, hey, this production wants to call you in to do one more day of production. They'll pay you for it. Are you down? And I was kind of like, what? are they gonna have me do? And they were kind of like, just some improv stuff, not really that big of a deal. They aren't being very specific. I think that they just wanna get like, you know, again, just sort of these like random tidbits to kind of stitch into the edit to make it all make sense. And when I get there, it's like chaos. No one knows what they're supposed to be doing. Everyone has different senses of what the day is. The director seems very stressed. And at one point he sort of like calls me into this back room and sits me down and he's like, okay, I have this brilliant idea. The character that I was playing was like very zany, very like odd, very strange. He was like, I have this great idea. Like we're gonna have this like social media footage of your character that gets leaked of you like, <laughs> of your character simulating sex with an inflatable dolphin. And I was like, what? He was like, yeah, well, like, you know, remember how you have that line about how, like, your character is super into marine biology? Yeah, so, like, you know, when we end up, like, there's this part where we're gonna blackmail your character, and so, like, we decided that, like, the blackmail would be this, like, video footage that your character shot years before simulating sex with an inflatable dolphin. And he was like, yeah, so, like, we have the dolphin in the other room, there's a bed, we have the cameras set up, it's just gonna take like, you know, 30 minutes, just go in there, improv, have fun with it, like not a big deal. I was trapped, I had agreed to do this day, I was paid for this day, and the director's big idea was that my character, who was a marine biology enthusiast, was going to get blackmailed at the end of the movie with a video of him simulating sex with an inflatable dolphin. This movie has never come out. I hope that it never comes out. But if it ever does, someone, somewhere, has footage of me pretending to have sex with an inflatable dolphin. So if you ever look at my career and say, wow, that Ryan McCartan has really done amazing things. I would love to have a career like his. Just remember kids, this industry is crazy. And sometimes you get hired to just show up and you don't even know what you're gonna do. And you haven't made it until a director asks you to have sex with an inflatable animal. So there you go, kids. Something to look forward to in your career. The next story is a much shorter one. I just kind of can't believe that it went this way. I did this television show where the character that I played had like an intimate scene with one of the main characters in the show. And for whatever reason, my shooting schedule was set up where the first thing that I shot, I mean, I, I worked with these people for like many, many weeks, but the very first thing I shot before I met anyone, before I shot anything else, the very first thing I shot, scene one, day one, for me, was 
the sex scene. I get to set, they do my hair and makeup, I'm chilling in my trailer, and finally they're like, okay, we're ready to call you to set. I get to set, there is no intimacy coordinator, which there usually is an intimacy coordinator when you're dealing with simulating sex. For whatever it's worth, there was also no intimacy coordinator on the movie where I simulated sex with an inflatable dolphin either. I go to set, I'm standing there, it's a room, there's like a blanket on the ground, that's where the sex is gonna happen. And I'm sitting there and I'm sitting there and I'm sitting there, finally, the director or someone walks in and sort of explains to me how the scene is gonna go. He keeps referencing this actress that I'm going to work with. I have not met her yet. Finally, she walks in, they introduce us, and then they say, okay, we're gonna start rolling. And literally, I said, hi, my name is Ryan. That is the only thing I said to this person. She said her name to me, that is the only thing she said to me. And then we got on the ground and simulated having sex for like an hour and a half in front of cameras. There was no introduction made. There was no one there to like make sure that we were comfortable with the choreography. There was nothing. It was literally, hi, my name is Ryan. And then we got down on the ground and we simulated sex for an hour and a half. And in hindsight, like I felt very safe with her and it went as well as it could have gone considering the circumstances, but I, no one made any attempt nor allowed any time for us to get to know each other at all. And there was no intimacy coordinator or anyone there to sort of be like, hey, are you guys comfy with this? Like anyone have any like no-no zones or like, does anyone have anything that they want to make sure that is flagged before you get on the ground and start going at it? Like we were like making out, ripping each other's clothes off. And all I knew is this person's name. Had no conversations with this person <laughs> prior to that and had no way to facilitate a conversation because there was no one there to do it. I will say, even though this is a bad example, I've actually noticed that things in this sort of realm have gotten a lot better in the past couple of years. I did a little indie film this summer where there was some sex simulation and there was an intimacy coordinator there. He was with us the whole time. He was fantastic, like truly above and beyond, made us feel so comfortable, was checking in with us after every single take. And I think that's becoming way more customary now in entertainment, so like, that's great. This was many years ago, this story that I just told. And I genuinely believe that we've made a lot of progress since then, but when I think about how that went, I still can't believe that there was no one on set to facilitate the intimate moment on camera, and no one thought about facilitating an introduction between us to make us feel comfortable off camera so that when we were on camera doing this intimate act, there was a sense of camaraderie and comfort there. It was the uncomfortable. We ended up becoming great friends and I think very highly of this person, but for that to be like day one, scene one, hi, nice to meet you, let's get on the ground, was awkward. And finally, Heather's fans rejoice a Heather's the Musical Dead Girl Walking story. This one was a doozy. So as you know, during Dead Girl Walking, we're up on that little platform. Barrett mounts me, takes my clothes off. I take her clothes off. We simulate sex. There's humping, there's singing, there's belting, there's screaming. It's great. We love Dead Girl Walking. So for those of you who have seen Heather's, directly after Dead Girl Walking, we sort of wake up the next day. There's a little scene between us. She says, I have to go to Heather Chandler's house and grovel. JD says, I'll come with you. That sequence carries into the scene with Heather Chandler, into making the prairie oyster with the Drano. Then Veronica goes into Heather Chandler's room. JD goes with her. Heather Chandler dies. They do the entire opening sequence of writing the letter, me inside of me. JD and Veronica have their sequence about like, we can't get caught. We have to do this, forge the letter, Sylvia Plath, bell jar. And then JD and Veronica exit. So from Veronica and JD entering for Dead Girl Walking, all the way through the middle of me inside of me, there is no time for anyone to leave the stage. So I'm laying there. Barrett crawls into my window. We start singing Dead Girl Walking. Barrett takes my shirt off as is choreographed and my shirt gets caught on my microphone. It, not, it doesn't just tear the microphone out. It bends the tip and breaks the microphone. This is information I do not know until later. While we're doing Dead Girl Walking, Barrett and I are very close to each other because we're like making out and screaming into each other's faces. And so her mic is picking up my sound. I know that my mic is like sort of cattywampus, but I have no idea that it's broken. So there's a blackout at the end of Dead Girl Walking. I'm trying to like sort of get the microphone situated, get it back onto my head. Then we start the scene 
before me inside of me and I start talking and there's no sound. And so I kind of like, you know, I'm going like this, trying to adjust my microphone. Oh, now my hair is crazy. Hold on. Trying to adjust my microphone to get some sound. Nothing is working. I put my shirt on. I put my little trench coat on. I'm like trying to scream my line so that people can hear what I'm saying. But like it's giving struggle. So as professional actors, we're trained for this. If you can't go off stage and get a new microphone, you have one option, which is to say all of your lines into the head of <laughs> your scene partner because their mic is still hot. So from the end of Dead Girl Walking, through the scene where we make the prairie oyster, through when Veronica confronts Heather Chandler, through when Ch Heather Chandler dies, through when Veronica and JD make the plan of how to get away with murder, all the way through the first half of me inside of me, I am literally like, saying all of my lines into Barrett's head because when she because when she ripped my shirt off she did it with such veracity that she destroyed my microphone and to this day I am still praying that someone is going to leak the slime tutorial footage of that exact show where I am literally like maybe we should put some Drano in it geez Heather Chandler sure is a right next to Barrett's skull because it is the only way that the audience could hear me. So there you go, daddy. Was I forced to have sex with an inflatable dolphin in a random independent movie I hope never sees the light of day? Did I simulate sex with a stranger on camera for an hour and a half without knowing anything about this person other than her name? Or did Barrett take my shirt off with such intensity that it forced me to have to say all of my lines into her forehead for the rest of the sequence while I was on stage, which is about 10 minutes? Which story is or contains the lie Guess in the comments below, and the next time I do a two truths and a lie for my career, I will reveal which one contains the lie and tell you three more stories. Be on the lookout for the video that Sam and I meant to be releasing this week that we will re-record at some point next week. As always, be sure to like and subscribe. We love you, and we'll see you on the next one. Goodbye, daddy.